And uh, Jennifer, do we want to wait until we start to get participants in to start recording? We've got 11 people, 12 people. I think as soon as you start talking, you can start recording. Okay. Well, welcome folks. We are going to get started in a moment. We're not officially started yet. There are two brain teasers on the screen. And so if you want to engage with us before we officially start, you can use the chat feature and you can try and say, yes, I solved the word puzzle or no, I don't know, or I only got one of them. And we'll give everybody about 30 seconds to join us. And then we'll go from there. I will share those answers before we officially start. So if you're just coming in, welcome. We're happy that you are here. We will get started in a moment. Enjoy the word quizzes, or word puzzles on your screen. Hey, Patsy, thanks for checking in with us. Nice to have you here. Hey, Travis Audubon, nice to have you here too. Welcome. All right, we're gonna give it just another like 15 seconds or so, and then we'll get started. So in the meantime, uh, I'm gonna give you the answers to our two little word quizzes here. The first word on top with the big U in the middle is ambiguous. Uh-huh. And then on the bottom, we have 10 S's followed by a C. So we got Tennessee for our two little word quizzes. And uh, let's officially jump into this so we have as much time with our panelists as possible. Welcome. This is Audubon, Texas, presenting our bird-friendly webinar series. Our conversation today is going to be around our conservation leaders program, a little bit of our history, and then having a panel discussion with some of our lovely graduated participants. So my name is Yvette Stewart. I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for Audubon, Texas. And joining me today, we have those three graduates. So we have Dylan Jordan from our Dallas Center. We have Shariah Jackson from our Houston cohort. And we also have Jordan Strait from our San Antonio cohort. Uh, and then joining me from Audubon, Texas and helping me with tech issues is Jennifer Croy. So Jennifer will be helping to share links with you folks. And she's also going to monitor the Q&A function for us. There are three ways that we are going to ask you, our audience, to engage with us today. First, the chat is open. We love to hear from you folks. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you are tempted to respond to one of my prompts, please share in the chat. If something that the panelists say really resonates with you or you want to share your own take on something, the chat's the perfect place to do that. If you have a question for myself or our lovely panelists, please use the Q&A feature. This allows us to track your questions. And if the chat is very active, you know, those things can kind of be scrolling pretty quickly. We don't want to miss your question. So again, please use the Q&A feature. That's our second way of engaging with you. And then we have a very short poll that we're going to start off today with. So Jennifer, if you can go ahead and launch that poll. Okay, so these are just three quick questions of what is your relationship like with nature? When did you first start to engage with nature? How often do you do it now? And what is your connection to nature? Do you feel safe out there? Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel like you're part of nature? So we would love to just hear from you folks. And we'll give everybody, you know, 30 seconds or so, maybe a minute to respond to these questions. Great, we're starting to see some responses coming in. Looks like most people really have a childhood connection to nature, which is lovely to see. We have more than half participants have responded, so we'll give everybody just another 30 seconds or so. Get those last couple of people in. Really 
really love seeing the positive responses that people feel really connected to nature, responsible for the health of the natural world. That's great. Okay, let's go ahead and close that poll. We got most of our participants to respond. And let's share the results for just a moment here. So you folks can go ahead and scroll and, and see where you fall within the range here. Okay, great. I'm going to stop sharing that poll. Great. All right. So let's get into today's topic. Oops. So first, Texas Women in Conservation is a luncheon, a fundraising luncheon that Audubon Texas has hosted since 2015. And the funds that were gathered there were used to launch this initial program in the 2015-2016 school year. As we developed that program, as we developed the partnerships there, we used the working title of GALS, which stood for Girls Action Leadership School. And that name quickly changed once we got the program launched. And for the first two or so years of our program, we referred to it as CAPS, which stood for Conservation Action Programs. Now, some point after the second year, um, the program name changed to the Audubon Conservation Leaders Program for Young Women, or ACL, just affectionately. With this year, we are very proud to be launching our ninth year of the program. We have once again decided to change the name of the program. And we did this in partnership with some of our long-term participants. Folks were asked to kind of weigh in on carrying a program with the name associated with a personal history of John James Audubon, as well as this kind of gendered language. And so with that background, the students kind of debated and they picked a couple of different names and we have landed on Texas Leaders in Conservation. We're really proud of the name and we're gonna shorten it, just like ACL was our kind of our short um, lingo for the program. We're gonna to refer to it going forward as TLC. And so I invite you folks in the audience to share in the chat, what do you think of when you hear the acronym TLC? I tend to think of one of two things, and so I'm interested to see what the audience has to say, how that resonates with you. Jennifer, would you put into the chat the link to the TLC website, please? So as I said, this is a partnership and we first started the partnership with the Young Women's Preparatory Network, which is a system of nine schools across the state. And we launched the program first in Dallas with Irma Rangel, and then also in San Antonio with the Young Women's Leadership Academy. In the 2018-2019 school year, we had our cohort in Houston and that was with Young Women's College Preparatory Academy. In the 21-22 school year, Ann Richards partnered up with Travis Audubon and their educator, Kaylee Zuzula, to have their own branch of the program, which is independent from what we do at Audubon Texas, but Kaylee and I shared some ideas around programming. We shared some ideas about how I was doing leadership activities, how she was gonna approach it. And with Travis Audubon, they are not only engaging with the high school students, they're also working middle school into that program. For me and for the, the TLC program here, I just focus with engaging with high school students. Now, unfortunately, in the 22-23 school year, the Houston um, School District and the Houston School in particular had a lot of changeover with their administrative staff and their teaching staff, and they were not able to host the program there last year and did not pick it up again this year. But we have a new partnership that we're very excited about. For our first time, we are working with a public high school to lead the TLC program, and that's Ball High School in Galveston. We are in partnership there with Sherry Rooks, who is a hospitality teacher, and we're taking this interesting approach of why people in the hospitality department should care about conservation, and the actions that we have throughout the state. Jennifer, in the, in the chat, will you please share the links for Travis Audubon, the Young Women's Preparatory Network, and Ball High School? Thank you. So let's talk about the founding ideas of the program. The program was designed to get female high school students to understand the conservation issues across our state. 
you know, Texas is a huge place, lots of different geographies, lots of different habitat. We wanted them to understand what was going on. We started at the local level with center connection, but then kind of expanded out to across the state. And we were talking to the students about things like habitat protection and habitat loss, water usage, watersheds, uh, species diversity, all of these like big important topics in conservation. And we did it through a lens of what were women doing for conservation? In a traditional, well, when we started the program, because we were based in San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston, we had individual staff members that were local to those areas that were responsible for the design and implementation of the program. Uh, a typical year would see us touching upon habitat restoration projects, field trip around water, which may be kayaking or water quality testing. Then we would also visit other nature organizations like zoos and aquariums, local state parks, um, or you know, other nature centers. Each school would have their own career panel, and that might look like just having three professionals sit down to a box lunch with students, or it might be a more like grand scale engagement uh, with a large panel and their entire school engaging with us. Each year, finish with a camp out to Goose Island State Park. So because of each location being in control or being controlled by the local staff and those local staff having other obligations, a lot of times the field trips were repeated from year to year. Repeating field trips and a desire to engage with as many students as possible meant that for the most part, students did not repeat in the program. There was no reason for them to come back. Occasionally we did have one or two students repeat but again, the experience that they got was not very varied, very varied. Um, so in the 2019-2020 school year, nope, I'm sorry, the 2018-2019 school year is when I was first introduced to this program. At the time, I was an educator at our Mitchell Lake Audubon Center. We experienced some staff change over there, and I stepped in to help lead the rest of the field trips for that year. I was also a chaperone for the 2019 camp out in June. In July of 2019, I stepped into my new role and about 50% of my time as a community outreach coordinator was so that I could figure out how to launch the ACL program every year at the school. My job was to plan all the field trips so that my colleagues at the different locations just had to run the actual activities with the students. They didn't have to do the planning. In evaluating the program, I wanted to focus on camaraderie between the schools. I wanted them to all have similar experiences so that when we got to go to camp in June of 2020, we would all have a similar basis to start building our connection on. So at the beginning of that 2019-2020 school year, we had three different educators across our state planning to lead the activities that I um, coordinated. Unfortunately, by the end of December, 2019, we had two educators who stepped away from Audubon. And so I stepped in to kind of fill those connections. I took over the Houston field trips and I helped transition the Dallas school from the leadership of the outgoing staff to the new incoming program manager. And then COVID smacked us down. And so unfortunately, by the time that all the field trips stopped in March of 2020, Everybody had been able to attend a night hike team building experience. Every school had gone to a wildlife rehab. Only one school had learned about prescribed burns and how it's important for habitat restoration. Only one school had had a career panel. Nobody got to go kayaking or do any sort of water quality testing. And nobody got to go to that camp out. Between the early termination of the 2019-2020 school year, the launching of the 2021 school year, and with some help from National Audubon, we redesigned this program. And we took the five strategic priorities from National Audubon and developed annual curricula based on these large overarching topics. So you can see here that for the 2021 school year, we were gonna talk about climate change and climate issues. 
for the 21-22 school year, we talked about fresh water. Last year was all about our coast and that was in line with our uh, centennial celebration of our coastal management. This school year, 23-24, we're learning about working land and next year we'll learn about bird friendly communities. So with these large overarching topics, every year has an, a specific focus and every year has corresponding field trips, which means we now can encourage students to come back as many years as they wish. Students do have to apply each year. It's a Google form, it's pretty straightforward. The determining factor is these short essay responses that they give. And if a student is returning, you know, we do kind of gauge their application based on how engaged they were in previous years. If you said you were part of the cohort, but you didn't come to the majority of the field trips, you didn't communicate well, well, we would reevaluate whether or not you are the best fit for the program. But we really pride ourselves on quality of connection over quantity. And so we keep our cohorts pretty small. We allow 12 students from each school. Ball High School has a slightly different setup because we are working with a specific class there, um, but it's still only 14, 15 people in that class. And in addition to wanting deeper connection with individual students who come on field trips, we also keep the quantity small because this allows us to use our 15 passenger vans to scoop kids up and lead them on field trips. If we have to wait on school buses for larger groups, it really restricts the amount of time that we get on our field trips. It restricts how far we can travel on our field trips. And so we're very adamant about using our 15 passenger vans. In addition to the quantity over quality aspect of our program, we continue to focus on giving students exposure to new and interesting science careers, things they may not hear about in their typical you know, school programming. We also have a heavy focus on leadership skills for the 21st century that focuses around consensus building, communication standards, voice and choice, saying no to things. Um, the power of leadership is as much about getting people to work together as it is about having good boundaries. So we really emphasize leadership skills. Each of our field trips has an element of physical challenge to it. And that may be like going on a good hike at one of our local state parks. It might be the physical challenge of just adapting to the crazy weather in Texas, the extreme hots and the extreme cold. It might be the physical challenge of that conservation action of replacing you know, invasive species, ripping them out and planting natives or other types of equipment that we're using. All of our field trips are very hands-on from very goofy getting to know you games through science observation, recording data, um, getting our hands dirty with those conservation actions, et cetera. And we really focus on giving students new and exciting experiences that they may not otherwise have through their school. Right, so with the changes to the program, not only did we redesign the program and the desired outcomes, we started to in implement ways to keep track of the student learning. So we use KWL charts, which stand for know, want to know, and learn. And so each year, depending on our topic, students would get the chart at the beginning of the year. There would be maybe three or four major topics that was in alignment with the, the topic for the year. So this year is working land. The KWL chart reflects soil. It reflects different types of plant material. It reflects different agricultural uses, hunting, all those kind of things. And then we also have a blank category. So maybe I don't think about all the big ways that this topic might appeal to the students. I want to hear directly from them what's exciting to them or interesting to them about this topic. And then once they have turned in the no and they want to know categories, I look through them and I look for A, misinformation. Right? It's very hard to teach someone new something new if they have this misconception that they deeply believe in. So we use the no category to understand the level of understanding students have. And then looking at what they want to learn, we build in those different elements into our field trips. Um, for the surveys, there's something from the American Camp Association. It's called a youth development survey. We modify that to be more in, in line with our topics. But the students, again, they go through the survey at the beginning of the year. They give us some insight into how they connect to nature. 
So similar to the poll questions that you folks did at the beginning of our presentation, they give us insight into their ideas around leadership and teamwork. And then we also have a category for careers. At the end of the year, students do that exact same survey over and the Audubon staff go through that and look for growth and development. You know, did they go from not feeling super safe in nature to really loving and connecting with nature? Did they not see themselves in a science career and now they do? And so we're using those surveys and the KWL charts to design what kind of programming we do and then to double check ourselves, were we successful? Do we make the grade or do we miss the mark? And, and really trying to understand what the students get out of the program. And finally, we use journals as a source of reflection on the field trip. There is lots of pedagogy around the power of reflection and taking time to write down your own observations and how you feel in relation to your experience. And that pedagogy says like, the more you do that, the easier it is to recall your prior experiences in nature. So we use those journals every field trip. And one of the trust things that we do within the program is I hold on to those journals so students don't have to keep track of it, but I never look through the journals without explicit consent from the students to read their thoughts. And I think that's a very important aspect of the program that we are always trying to build community and trust with them. Okay, we're almost done. We're almost to our wonderful panelists. And so again, with that program redesign and now using these strategic priorities, with a little bit of help from National Audubon's Maggie Walker Fund, we were able to launch an internship that we are continuing to today. So the internship is based at our Trinity River Audubon Center. It is eight weeks from the time the student graduates from Rangel to, usually it's, it finishes before they have to go off to college, but occasionally we've had to shorten the time so that student can leave for college. It is paid, it is 40 hours a week, and they are deeply embedded in the staff at Trinity River. Um, that is currently our best location. We hope to expand at some point to the San Antonio Center, uh, but right now Trinity has the most space to welcome an intern. In the internship, there are five areas of focus to give the student a wide variety of experience. First and foremost, there's conservation action. So the Trinity River Audubon Center has a wonderfully restored prairie habitat that they're constantly working on. In this picture, this is Shane Dell. This is our very first intern. She's in the yellow pants. And Shane Dell did a wonderful job of planting natives, you know, sprouting seeds for us, keeping track of the plants in the greenhouse, and really was embedded in this program of trying to grow these native plants. In addition to the conservation action, about 20% of the internship is around environmental education. Now for me, my background is learning environmental education through AmeriCorps, and it totally changed my life. I did not know how much I would love environmental education until I had that experience. So for me, um, as somebody who's leading this program, I think it's so important to give our intern an experience around environmental education and see if it sparks something for them. In addition, they are embedded in a nonprofit. And so we want them to understand what does it take to run a center? And so they spend some of their time welcoming guests, setting up for events, cleaning up after events, uh, in interacting with our volunteers, whatever the center needs to be a functional organization. And then 20% uh, of our time is used on social media. And Jennifer, if you would share the Trinity River Facebook page, and as well as Cruz's Corner, I'll talk about that in just a moment. So if you could put that into the chat, please. So the social media is a really important aspect for the internship. You know, these younger generations are so good with creating fun and engaging content. Um, Shane Dell did a great job of having very goofy and funny videos created. Jackie, who was our internship or our intern last year, she did an incredible job also creating beautiful videos that really showcase the diversity at the center. And in addition, the last portion of their internship is around passion projects. So Shane Dell's passion project was again, that, that greenhouse work and getting to know the plants. Jackie's most recent um, passion project was Cruises Corner, which is a wonderful four piece blog that she put together around habitat restoration. So those are in the chat. I encourage you folks to check out those links. And so what have we learned 
over the eight years of this program, now starting our ninth year. First, we went from a very transactional, superficial one-time engagement to feeling really embedded in the school experience and in the life experience of our participants. Um, and then the next thing that we really changed up was from the 2019 camp experience and all that I saw in those field trips, it was very go, 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 get up, get dressed, do this, do that, get over here, just constant activity. And instead we changed the dialogue of the program to be a little bit more, tell me more, go on. Like, what's your experience here? What's your thought? To be more relational with our participants. We really practice active listening and giving concrete feedback to people because that's how we grow and that's how we learn. I just came across this incredible John Muir quote yesterday and I feel like it is very much in alignment with how we try to approach our program. And so he said, my working definition of love is sustained, compassionate attention. When you pay attention to another, it changes your relationship with them and it also changes you. Attention is also what forms and sustains our relationship with nature. Your attention is one of the greatest gifts you can give to the world. It is a celebration. It is a song of connection. It is a prayer to the wonder of what is around us. And so again, we really take that into account as we're doing these active listening and, and community connection with the students. Pivoting is also so important to the program. The world that we live in is messy. If you look at the last three years of what's gone on in our country, you cannot possibly expect to get people passionate about science and conservation if you ignore the racism and the violence that's happening in our, in our society, if you ignore like school shootings, if you don't talk about the transphobia and the you know, anti-legislations that are happening. So we created space for students to share where they're at mentally. And we do a lot of checking in, like, what do you need? Do we wanna talk about this hard topic? Do we wanna distract ourselves with science? What do they need? Because ultimately this program is about trusting the youth. They are more than capable. Like I could never do this program without their leadership as well. So we have to trust them and we have to focus on their needs. So in the end, my hope is that through this conservation leaders program, we are teaching students to love the diversity of Texas and the wider world so that as they go out into that wider world, they know how to protect our different flora and fauna and they can take their passion out with them. So that's it. I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna stop sharing here. And we are going to get into the panel discussion with our lovely panelists. Hello, hello. Thank you for being here with me and sharing your opinions with the folks that are here with us. Um, we are going to get started with a lovely um, introduction that I'm stealing from Simone Gamble. And so Simone created and operates ORS, which stands for Organizer, Activist, Artist, Advocate Referral System. And Jennifer, if you would put the link for ORS into the chat so people can see that, I would appreciate it. So in in the summer of 2021, Simone hosted this incredible panel. And as she introduced the panelists, she made this really great point, which is that white supremacist culture tends to have us introduce ourselves with our title or what we produce, but our identities are so much more than that. Our identities are complex, beautiful things. So like for instance, for myself, I consider myself a lifelong learner, I am a high five enthusiast, I'm a hugger, I'm a jigsaw person, I love to do just jigsaw puzzles. And so with that context, I'm gonna have the different leaders come off mute and share some of their identifiers. And Shariah, I'm gonna start with you. How do you identify? I describe myself as adventurous, passionate, and environmentalist, and a go-getter. Um, I'm also an only sister and the only daughter. And I think with being those things, I became a very observant person, which I think brought the thrills and excitement of like going out, kayaking, camping, et cetera. I also thought of being a black woman in the STEM environment when answering this question. And I wanna be addressed as 
the same way as like male and or white my white coworkers may be addressed and that's my name and like what exactly I do because you never hear someone in the same profession or in general that's white a male be addressed as oh this is blah 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 they're white they're this and they're that a hundred percent, right? We are more than just what you superficially see here. Thank you so much for starting us off with how you identify. Um, Jordan, I'm gonna jump to you next. What are some of the ways that you identify that you want people to know about you? Jordan, I identify myself as someone who's goal-oriented, driven, very observant, and it's just someone who is an advocate, an environmentalist, family oriented. I love spending time with people, getting to know others, um, being able to network within that also. Just someone who's able to try new things and not be afraid to step out of their comfort zone. I see all of that in you. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Dylan, last but not least, how do you identify? What's important to you? I definitely identify as a learner. I love learning. I love being in education. Definitely an artist. I've been doing art for as long as I remember, and I hope to continue doing art for as long as possible. Definitely an environmentalist. Um, I'm an only child, and I definitely describe myself as an adventurer. Awesome. I see all that in you too. And actually, your art is one of the things that uh, when we first got to know each other, we shared a lot of that through the climate year. So Wonderful. Thank you so much for introducing yourselves. Um, Jordan, you mentioned being an activist and what you didn't mention was speak up, but that kind of filters into my next question for everybody. And so I'm going to start with you, Jordan. And so my question to you is, how did your experience within TLC slash ACL help you learn to speak up for yourself or nature? My journey with Audubon, it was something that was happening from the start. I was getting out of my comfort zone. I was being pushed into new things that I never thought I would ever experience. And through that, it was just, you know, making me more open-minded. And so I remember having a conversation with Yvette one day. We were having our Zoom discussions because it was during COVID, but she sparked an interest in me that I never knew that I had. And it was very, very inspiring. She was checking up on us, asking us how we were doing. And at the time it was very rough with the murder of George Floyd and everything that was going on in society. She was someone that I could speak to and be open to without being judged and without being afraid to be judged. And so in that moment, when I was addressing some concerns I had, she allowed us to know that we can utilize our voices, that we shouldn't be afraid to do that also. And so by having someone who is a mentor and is someone who's able to speak to me that way and make me feel comfortable, I began a new journey of advocacy. Me and my group of Audubon conservation leaders, we got together, we wrote a, a letter to our school and addressed our concerns with racism, um, being activists about racism and anything within like justice, whether it was environmental, anything. Um, and so we started an organization called Speak Out, and it provided resources for students, staff, community members to become advocates for anything that they were passionate about. And so through that, we had monthly meetings, we had a teacher sponsor, and that alone taught me to not be afraid, to become an advocate, to not necessarily have to be that person to start the conversation, but to continue it also. And so it wasn't that because it was trending at the time, it was we need to get more advocates out here. We need to be a community. And that's something that I'm still passionate today. And I'm minoring or having a concentration in policy and regulations. So I continue to utilize my voice and the advocacy tools I gained through Audubon. That is awesome. I love hearing that you're continuing with it. Um, and Speak Out was really in, informational for a lot of people in your community. And it's still going, as far as I know, today at Young Women's uh, Leadership Academy. So thank you so much for sharing your story there. Um, Shariah, I'm going to pass it to you, too. How has being in the program helped you speak up for yourself or nature? I think it really helped me about how I approach people when starting a conversation about nature or when having one. Um, there's a lot of conspiracy theorists in my life. So if a 
situation happens that's clearly dealing with climate change and global warming, though I really had to practice kind of just accepting their point of view while also getting my point of view point of view around. So um, it helped me call them in versus calling them out and rudely not accepting what they believe. Jennifer, would you share the Houston blog that the Houston graduates created in the summer of 2022? This is another way that you practice kind of sharing your passion and your knowledge and giving people ways to be advocates for nature. Thanks, Shreya. Dylan, I'm gonna throw it over to you as well. Um, you have also, similar to Jordan, you shared some information with your school and some feedback to your school. Will you tell the story of what you did and why you did it? Yes, so my school is located in the Fair Park District of Dallas. If you don't know where that is, it's where the state fair is held every year. So pretty much for the majority of the year, the little area that we're in is basically deserted, tons of parking lots, really, really urban, basically no nature. And so for our school, we just wrote a letter to administration, both asking them to be more considerate of conserving energy concerning resources, and also to try and get some natural spaces, especially because a lot of us at that school were from the surrounding area with really no parks, no access to nature preserves, except for this program. And really they followed through with it really well. Obviously there was a lot of pushback from the district regarding some of the conservation things, but it did really get the ball rolling. So now we have this really nice conservation garden in the front. There were actions to start planting some trees around the school. So that was really amazing. And it only happened because of the program. The program definitely taught us as students that we can cooperate with the administration at our school and that if we speak, then they're willing to listen. But if we don't speak about it, then they're just not going to be aware and nothing's going to get done. Yeah, man, the youth have so much power, but knowing that you can actually gather that and then give it to other uh, people, you know, give it to the adults in your life or, or lift up other students, I think that is kind of one of the things that we want to grow in the program. We want to make sure each person feels empowered. So along those lines of using your voice, I want to have the conversation kind of turn towards the renaming of the program. And so again, over the summer, um, we started this conversation of how do we create a name for the program that reflects the inclusion aspects of the program. And Dylan, you were there with us at summer camp when we had this conversation. So I'm gonna start with you first and then we'll go back to Jordan and Shariya. What do you wanna tell us about the experience of helping us select a new name? So basically Yvette approached us during one of our lunch breaks about the renaming conversation and kind of explained why this idea was being approached at all. So it's basically because of two main reasons. One, there was a lot of um, principles that the Audubon, the man that the Audubon Society is named after that we really didn't align ourselves with and that we didn't agree with anymore. And then two, to be more gender inclusive, the full name of ACL did include women because we all were from the women's preparatory schools. But already at these schools, there's a lot of very gendered language being used, a lot of like, you know, girl power, wearing the skirts as uniform and everything. So changing the name to us was really important because one, we really do not agree with the principles that the Audubon um, Society name aligns itself with. And we didn't want that to represent us as students and as people, especially because so many of us are activists in our communities. And then also we really wanted to make it more gender inclusive. And this was before we knew about the public school being added on to it. And this was just to kind of be more gender inclusive to our own schools as well. Yeah, beautifully said. Um, specifically the John James Audubon, his racist history is, is what we had talked about, right? As a national organization, we are trying to move away from that history, but it is tied, it's, it's there in that name. So thank you so much for highlighting that. And Jordan, I'm gonna to jump to you next. Um, you are already graduated from the program, but I pulled you back into the conversation because you have been such an advocate. Will you tell us your experience with the renaming? Touched by Yvette about the renaming. I was very excited 
one because she included so much history that I didn't know. So I was like, oh my goodness, let me read this and let me learn about it. And so, of course, being a part of the program while it was called ACL sits very close to my heart. But I think it's so important to acknowledge that change is important and that it's important to acknowledge the issues that we've had in the past. So to be able to take something, understand it, change it, and grow from it, we're creating something that's not necessarily different, but something that's leading to more change within the future. If we're talking about what can we do right now to change things that we're doing in society, why can't we start with our very own organization? And so the renaming not only will enable us to continue to rewrite or write a new future for us, but also include more individuals. I think it's so important that more people feel comfortable when entering organizations that don't have a label of necessary like gender or what gender is specifically supposed to be within like the organization but to be able to be an area that being in that area uh, you cut out just a little bit with your last couple words do you want to reiterate that last sentence i think that it's important can you hear me yes i think that it's important to create an area where people are comfortable comfortable and confident within um, that isn't necessarily tied or bound to gender and what someone would identify as. So just an area where people are comfortable is very, very important. And that's what Audubon was for me. So to be able to have that for other people by having it renamed to TLC is just amazing. Great, thank you for clarifying your last point there. Sharia, do you have anything to add around that conversation of renaming and how you felt being included? In the meeting? I really love the fact that we were um, finally holding James Audubon accountable because I remember seeing some information about him and his racist history a couple years back and I really love the fact that it's more inclusive and the fact that it's like it's Texas leaders rather than women leaders in conservation because like Dylan and Jordan said there are so so many people that don't just identify as a girl. So they may be identifying or having trouble coming out and identifying as being girls or not just girls or not even having a gender at all. So I hope that this name in the future makes them more comfortable and allows them, like this is a space where they can be themselves. They don't have to be just boxed in this one category. Let's knock down all those walls, right? Like let's have as many people come into nature and connection with nature as possible, regardless of how they identify. Thank you guys. Um, so, you know, we've touched upon these really beautiful and different aspects of the program. One thing I would like to hear from each of you is why did you decide to come back to the program for as many years as you did? So Jordan, you were here for four years, Shariah, you were with me for two, and you continue to be engaged when I pop into Houston and we can go do some cleanups. And then Dylan, you were in the program for three years. And so Shariah, I'm going to start with you this time. Why did you decide to come back to the program after your first year? I think it was the environment of my school. You know, it was always robotics, engineering. It was just like, it was a very broad environment of STEM so being at Audubon allowed me to like finally allow my interests to be set free and it was just an escape and a breath of fresh air from the same repeating 11 10 years that I had gone through and you really blossomed in that environment like when we got you out into the state parks you were just like so on top of, of seeing things and being in the moment awesome Dylan, for yourself, why did you come back after the first year? I definitely agree with what Shariah said. Rangel is also very um, STEM, but kind of like exclusive of the environment. And we really didn't have a lot of opportunities, especially being where we were in Dallas in one of the like, in the most urban area, like I said, just parking lots surrounding us. So it was really nice to get that experience, especially because I myself had never heard of the Trinity River Audubon Center before. I'd never heard of any of these state parks that we went to. So I stayed because it was a really good experience. You know, being able to go on the field trips was fun. 
And then it felt really meaningful for me to just be able to connect with my fellow students and be able to share this experience. Even now when I'm in college and everything's really hectic, I'm still talking to the people that I met in the Audubon group just because I really grew close to everybody. And I mainly did stay for that kind of connection. Thank you so much for sharing that. Again, that connection is so important to me within the program and creating our experiences. So I'm glad that resonates with you. Jordan, why did you come back for all four years of your high school experience? I initially got into Audubon because my teacher was the sponsor for the program. And so she introduced it to us and she was just like, if you guys are willing to participate in this organization, I highly suggest that you apply. And mind you, at the time I was terrified of bugs scared of dirt. <laughs> Just being outside was a little scary for me. So I decided to take the opportunity to step out of my comfort zone. And I am beyond aesthetic that I did, because that's why I'm here today studying environmental science. Um, so my first year was all about me stepping out of my comfort zone, getting to try new things. And I fell in love with environmental science. I never would have imagined doing the th things that I've done through Audubon. But to be able to meet new people, try new things, work with other organizations and network, it has blossomed into more than just a hobby, but a potential career opportunity. And so through Audubon, I learned more about myself and I learned my connection to nature, what I love to do. Um, and so I got my sister into it, my younger sister. She attends the Young Women's Leadership Academy and to see her step out of her comfort zone because she's more afraid than to like of bugs than I am <laughs> and so to see her step out of her comfort zone and continue it makes my heart happy it almost brings me to tears I brought my best friend into the program also and so to be able to create the relationships that I have through the program and to see my sisters get involved in this um, opportunity and to still be best friends with one of my old Audubon members uh, we go to the same college and we're studying the same thing. So it's just amazing. It created doors and opportunities for myself. And I'm going to continue to utilize all the skills that I've learned and possess through the organization. I would never know that Ashley is scared of bugs because she never responds. So you must be a good role model for her. And actually, I'm going to use that as a segue to our next question. I'm going to start with you, Jordan, which is what advice would you give to somebody your age about spending time in nature? Um, I would say, one, starting out, like I said, don't be afraid to try new things. Get out there, take a nature walk, be able to bird, be able to identify plants and other organisms. Um, I think it's so important to get quality time with nature to, one, not only be just in, like, natural light and just soak in all the energy, because I feel like it is very different. When I'm stuck in a building or stuck in an office setting, I feel like I'm being like put into a box almost. But when I'm outdoors, there's so much I could venture out into, whether it's the lakes, whether it's the ocean, whether it's the river, whether it's looking at plants, animals, insects, there's so much you can do. So don't be afraid to try or be introduced to these new things. And that's exactly what I did. And so I would just say, be open-minded and just try it. Beautifully said. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Shariah, kind of building on what Jordan had to say. What would you advise somebody your age about spending time in nature? I think before the program, there was a, I had a lot of hesitance. And in my mind, there was a lot of fear about what I didn't know. So I think my advice would be not to think about it too much and just to go for it. Out in nature is also like a huge scale, right? So if you do have some of those fears, maybe out in nature is just walking around your block, looking at the plants, whether they're native or not. And so there's small scale. And so I, I like that you're both kind of touching upon the fear that may have held you back and how you've overcome it and why it's worth it. Dylan, do you have anything to add there? What, what would, advice would you give to someone your age about spending time in nature? I definitely agree with everything that Shariah and Jordan said. And then also just like, if you really know absolutely nothing about nature in your local area, 
really just kind of looking into even local parks. During online school, I would go to the park down the street from my house every single day. I would sit like in my backyard and just like look at the trees while I was on a Zoom call, things like that. And looking into local programs, Dallas for teens during the summer, that's this thing where if you go to the library and you like get a library card or you show them your library cards, you're eligible to go to all of these different science museums and outdoor activities for free. So definitely kind of seeing like what events are happening locally. And then also just remembering that it's okay to ask questions. There are no stupid questions, especially when it's something safety related outdoors. And then finding like-minded friends. I've been able both in Dallas and where I am now in Western Massachusetts, I've been able to find like-minded friends where on the weekend or even like during the middle of the day, we'll be like, oh, do you wanna go to the park? Oh, do you wanna go on a walk down the river? So doing that is a really easy way because you're with someone that you trust, someone that you know super well, and you're able to have a really fun time outside. Awesome. I love that. Like bring a buddy with you. You know that again, if you do have those fears, that can kind of help make you feel more confident and more brave. And Dylan, I would also say that occasionally you send me screenshots of using um, apps for identifying stuff outside. And I love that. Um, so if folks are participating in this and they want youth around them to get more engaged, don't forget about technology in nature. There's lots of great ways to kind of learn about the world around you through apps. So um, we are almost to the end of our hour together and we have a couple of questions I can see in, in the Q&A. So before we switch over to hearing from um, the public, people who are listening to us, I wanna have one last round of questions. And my question for each of you is, I would like to hear, what is your fondest memory of the program? Like, is there a field trip that stands out, a game that we played, and a fact that you learned? Like, what is the thing that stands out to you most about your experience within the program? And I'm just gonna go through our schools of so Dallas, Dylan, I'm gonna start with you first, and then I'll go to Houston, and then I'll go to San Antonio. Definitely my fondest memory is my most recent one, being able to go to camp. I joined in, gosh, I don't even remember when this show was like so long ago, 2020, right? Yep, the school year of 2021. So our climate virtual yeah. year. I joined during the pandemic because I was really bored at my house and I needed something to do. This got me here. But because I joined during the pandemic year and then afterwards, we still had a lot of restrictions. We weren't able to do camp. And so going out to camp for the week, being able to and having like the privilege to take that time off and be able to just go be disconnected from everything, you know, go into nature was really amazing. Dallas, you can't see the stars at all anywhere. So we got to go out in the middle of the night, go see the stars. It was beautiful. We got to go out on a boat and I held jellyfish. It was really, really an amazing time and going bird banding. And that really like sparked a love of that for me. And now I'm in the ornithology club here going bird banding in a couple of weeks. Definitely that just like, it was such an amazing way to kind of end my experience in the program. And I really enjoyed it. Well, that is awesome. I love hearing that. Camp for me is also magical. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I'm very sad that Jordan and Shreya have not been able to come to the overnight camp, although we did get some day camp stuff in. Um, and I'm going to tell you my favorite memory, Dylan, was going to Cedar Hill State Park during spring break this past year. And we had kind of an unofficial field trip where I offered to the Dallas students to come out for the day. And you and Estrella and Blue came out and we just had a wonderful like magical day of birding in a super cold and windy day. And you just trucked through. So thank you for sharing your favorite experience. That's my favorite memory of you. Shariah, I'm gonna jump over to you. What is your favorite memory from the program? I think it's the entire program in itself. Um, spending the time in the state parks, meeting new people, doing different um, conservation projects and just spending time with people who share the same interests as me. So my favorite memory of you was taking everybody to Brazos Bend for the first time and we climbed the observation tower and everybody was like, oh, this is uncomfortable. I don't like heights. And we still did it. And you were so brave and you got to the top. And that was like one of my standout moments with you. So thank you so much. And Jordan, last but not least, what is your fondest memory of the program? So hard. And then narrow down one, like, 
but um I would say for sure I got like the top three is of course camp was absolutely amazing but we did get rained out but we still came back together and just had the best time ever and going to Government Canyon which is a state park um like north of San Antonio and I think that stood out to me because I was able to be on that trip with my younger sister and so it was absolutely amazing to see her also step out of her comfort zone and just blossom into the environmentalist that she is now um and probably the last one would be virtually when we were able to do water quality testing um looking at acidity looking at the ph of water that was something i also got to do with my sister and so kind of being in the comfort of our own homes while still being able to do something that's related to environmentalists and just like sustainability overall and kind of fighting with her a little bit about the pH but it was just absolutely amazing and so fun to see how we can transition from being in person to online and still being able to make the program work. Thank you for highlighting that because that was again during our climate year where we were forced to do everything virtually and that was actually one of my favorite years of programming because I saw everybody twice a month regardless of COVID and so that was really amazing. I love hearing that that was like a standout activity for you to do the pH test. Um, but my favorite memory of you was actually your speech at the Texas Women in Conservation Luncheon, not this past year, but the year before that. You were on fire on that stage and you were so passionate and so poised. Like I cannot imagine being your age and so in charge of that uh, presentation. You were just amazing. So thank you all so much for sharing your experience within the program. We have just a couple minutes left. And we have just a couple of questions. So Jennifer, will you read off the questions for us? Yes. Hey, everybody. Um, first one, would you be able to share the John Muir uh, quote? Sure, I will read it again, and then I will share it in the chat. Give me one second here. <laughs> okay, the quote. My working definition of love is sustained, compassionate attention. When you pay attention to another, it changes your relationship with them. And it also changes you. Attention is also what forms and sustains our relationship with the natural world. Your attention is one of the greatest gifts that you can give the world. It is a celebration. It is a song of connection. It is a prayer to the wonder of what is around us. And this was connected to me through a nature journaling class at the NAAEE conference. And I will find that link and share it with folks. Okay, second question. Uh, does the program include involve non-binary students? I was also curious how if the program accom accommodates disabled students. Do any of the panelists wanna share your experience um, with other people who may or may not have strong identities or gender identities? Um, how you think we incorporated that well into the program or not? Go ahead, Dylan. So, um working like kind of identifying myself like as somebody that's more like gender questioning and knowing a lot of people in the program that were even before the name change was made like official or anything it still felt incredibly inclusive everybody knew that even if they didn't identify as a woman or a young woman that they could still join the program um Yvette and everybody in the group like would always gender you correctly we would always make sure to share pronouns to make them very visible and then also as a disabled student that was in the group, I always felt incredibly welcome. Yvette always worked to make sure that I was accommodated. So yeah, on both accounts, I definitely, me and my fellow students felt very welcomed. Thank you for sharing your experience and your perspective. Uh, Jordan or Sharia, did you have any input there around the gender question? I think that okay. through oh. the years, Oh, sorry. Throughout the years of Audubon, it was made very comfortable. So that was something that we were always asked. How do we identify? How would we prefer to be addressed, even if it was just by a nickname or with like gender overall? And so as someone who identifies as like she, her, but I have friends in the program who identified as they, them, it was made to be like comfortable, made to be just kind of like a family instead of just being a group of women. It was something that was very different and super comfortable amongst each other. Wonderful, thank you. And Shariah, you also had some thoughts. Yeah, Ms. Yvette, make sure that everyone was comfortable um, no matter what they identified as. 
And I think, you know, people, for people who didn't, who weren't as strong as other people were in some, um, in terms of their abilities, like disabilities, she definitely made room. She didn't make you feel bad about it. She definitely helped you feel welcome and still helped you find a part and able to be, uh, to be able to be included in some of the things that we did. Thank you. I'm glad that that comes across. Um, from my perspective, as I create field trips, as I think about activities, as I think about the topics that we want to tackle, I am very aware of ability. Specifically, you know, can people walk comfortably if we're going to go visit a state park? What kind of um, what kind of trails are we walking on? Is it too sloped? Is it you know too hard? And so we do take that into account. In my time of running the program, we have never had anybody that was severely mobily disabled. And so we are aware like that could happen in the future and we will make efforts to um, accommodate folks. Um, the only thing that I don't have a clear vision on right now is transportation. So when we use our 15 passenger vans, if I had to fold up a wheelchair or so in it, that may be difficult, but we will work with schools in the future if we need to do that. And it is a, a personal mission for me that gender inclusive actions are always being available. So again, respecting pronouns, respecting chosen names, asking people how they identify and making sure that if someone is questioning their gender and trying to figure out who they are today, that I understand who that is being shared with. Is it just within me and within this program? Is it with the other students? Is it with the other adults that may be chaperoning? Is it with your parents? And so understanding that level is really important to building trust. Again, respecting where people are in their life today and where they want to be in the future and trying our best to make sure that everyone feels welcome is really a part of my goal. So Jennifer, are there other questions? I think that's all I saw. Yeah, no, that was it. The only other thing someone was just checking in to see when the webinar recording would be available. So I posted in the chat, we'll have it up next week. Great. Um, well, we are at time. And so panelists, I'm going to come around to each of you one final time is there any other thoughts that you want to share with the program now that you have graduated out? Or uh, maybe a better way to think about it is for the audience that is watching us, what do you want them to know about yourself, your connection to nature, or anything along those lines? So we're going to go reverse order from schools. So we're going to start with San Antonio, jump to Houston, and finish at Dallas. So Jordan, take us home. What's your last takeaway for the program? you. Audubon has shaped me into the person, the advocate, the environmentalist that I am today. So I'm currently studying environmental science with a concentration in policy and regulations here at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. I'm in my sophomore, junior year. I came in with a couple of credits, but my love for environment or for the environment and environmental science overall truly stemmed from the experiences that I've had at Audubon to be able to network to meet new people, to mingle, that has made me be as successful as I am and to be as confident as I am in what I am doing. And so to be able to come here with the experiences that I have had and share them with my classmates has made me not only stand out, but just even appreciate the education that I'm receiving even more. And so to be the advocate, to be the environmentalist is absolutely amazing. I would have never seen myself here, if I went back just four or five years ago, I would have never thought I would have swam with dolphins. I would have never thought I would have kayaked in the ocean, done research on a boat or any of that nature, because that's not how I saw myself. But to be able to realize that I can do these things and that I am going to do these things it is absolutely amazing. And I think Audubon for all the opportunities that I have been given and I can't wait to continue to collab with uh, Audubon and my on-campus student-led sustainability organization. That's right. I will see you in 10 days. We'll be doing some birding in Corpus Christi. And then you're going to come out bird banding with me at some point. So thank you so much for summing up that you know, powerful impact on your future and your career choice. Shariah, where are you at? What do you want your takeaway to be here? I totally agree with Jordy. Um, it has helped me tremendously shape the person who I am because if you would have asked me if I would have been stepping in the woods with potential jump outs of spiders and snakes, I tell you absolutely not. Um, I was able to go kayaking 
which I'm terrified of open water would never have done had I not joined this program. And yeah, like Jordan, uh, I'm studying environmental science with a focus in fish and wildlife conservation or fish and wildlife management. So I hope to either take that degree and go to the Sportsman Paradise, Louisiana and work along the coast or um, go to law school and study environmental law or even just do both. So. Yes, you would make an amazing environmental lawyer because you'd be like, that's wrong. This is right. Get this. Like, you'd be so on top of it. And I will see you for our coastal cleanup on October 27th. Thank you so much. Dylan, last but not least, what's your takeaway for the program? Definitely like um, Shariah and Jordan, I feel like it's really shaped who I am now. And it's also really built like a stronger connection with my family. My mom and her dad have always been like bird lovers. My grandpa used to work for the park service. He used to tell me when I was little that he worked with Smokey the Bear. So it's really helped me build a stronger connection with my family. And it's also um, given me something that I am super passionate about and that I'm staying connected with. Even while I am in college, I'm still going out looking at birds. I'm still going oh you see that thing right there I know what that is when I'm going outside I have been like on my friend telling them we need to go kayaking like we need we need to go hike this mountain like everything looks so cool and so having that de-stressing hobby has been really really important for me and unfortunately I'm not going into environmental science I'm not that much of a stem person so it's not for me but um, I'm probably going to be majoring in women and gender studies. And so being able to take in account like how exactly racism impacts um, your relationship with the environment, I'm able to pull in what I learned from this program, especially in that aspect, and pull it in with like my perspective in what I'm studying. I love that. Right? Connection to, again, our identities is so crucial to how we show up in the world. And when you feel safe and seen, you are able to show up for bigger causes outside of yourself. And so thank you so much, Dylan, for taking your passion for the environment and bringing it into connection, community, and identity. I love that. Guys, this has been amazing. I will talk to you every day, all day, whenever you want. Um, but thank you, everybody in the audience, for watching, for listening, for engaging with us. Uh, we will share this recording again in about a week, like Jennifer said, and that's it. Thank you so much for learning about Texas Leaders in Conservation, TLC. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful day. See ya. Bye.